Well, over the next uh, several weeks or so, I want to ref- I want to reflect together as a church family uh, on Christmas, and we're going to gaze with wonder on the one laying in the Bethlehem major 2,000 years, actually a little bit over 2,000 years ago. Uh, but that said, over the next couple of weeks, I'd like to take a less traveled pathway. Uh, and instead of turning immediately to the most familiar Christmas passages, and of course that would be Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, and, and I would encourage you with your family during this season to turn just to those places, but instead I want us to gaze on these glorious events, of course the glorious event of Christ's coming, from different perspectives that are also contained in God's Word. And if you want to think with me about this a little bit, think about what I want to do. Have you ever climbed an observation tower before? Or maybe uh, you've uh, climbed a mountain. But as you're going up the observation tower, as you get to each landing, have you noticed that the perspective changes? Or perhaps it's your own house. Maybe you have a three-story house and there's a little window in the attic. A lot of old houses had that. Do you you ever live in a house like that? And it's the same picture that's out the picture window in the front of the house. But when you ascend a couple flights of stairs and get up to that attic window, it's a lot smaller and it's probably dusty because it doesn't get cleaned as much. But have you noticed that the perspective, looking on the same picture, is fuller? It, It highlights different things. We see it from a different angle. And and you see that when climbing a mountain, when going up an observation tower. Uh, I've had that experience here uh, since I moved to Iowa. I had never before climbed a grain bin, but I had the opportunity to go up the stairs, and the perspective changed the higher I got. And and, uh, that's what we want to do by looking at a couple of other passages also found in the New Testament that gaze with wonder on Christ's coming. Passages that maybe aren't turned to as much at Christmas as really they honestly could be, because they're all about Christ's coming. Now, the words of the Christmas carol, What Child Is This?, really capture the question that all of us must ask and answer. The well-known carol begins with these words, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring Him, Lord, the Babe, the Son of Mary. And this morning we're going to be turning to, the Galatia, uh, to Galatians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 7. And if you'd like to follow along, go ahead and turn there. And I'll read the passage now. Again, this is Galatians uh, chapter 4 in the first seven verses. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Did you catch verses 4 and 5? These verses paint a compelling summary of the message of Christmas. Did you catch that summary? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let's jump into the passage and begin looking closely at the first three verses. And we'll see simply this. Without Christ's coming, another way to say that is without Christmas... There would only be slavery, slavery without hope of release. It's reality, apart from Christ, there is only spiritual slavery. And these verses begin taking us to a significant custom in the Roman world, to a ceremony that marked a son's coming of age. A a son and the heir to his father's estate officially came of age 
at a ceremony that had religious, social, and political significance. The father selected the, selected the specific time for this important event, this important moment, when his son became a man. But until this event, the heir of the estate was not treated differently from a slave because the heir did not have authority, but was rather subject to guardians and managers, or some translations say guardians and trustees, until this set time when the son would become of age. Now, I understand that, generally speaking, this is probably a foreign concept to most of us. Uh, but this is the picture that is in mind here. And with that in mind, uh, as I mention the word, simply take the word on my lips, as a matter of fact, slavery, uh, we need to think about a few things. And please hear me. It's important to understand that the slavery in the Roman world was significantly different from the slavery that was practiced here in the United States before the Civil War, a practice that we ought to lament. Now, I want to continue in the passage, but I'll just pause here. There's lots of discussion. People say when the word slavery comes up, it sometimes brings an emotional response because it's just horrifying to think what happened not that long ago. And there's lots of discussion in our society and in, the, in churches today about how we ought to respond to past generation sins. Now, I don't begin to have the final word, but let me tell you, biblically, I think that it is at least this. We ought to lament. That doesn't mean that we confess and repent of sin, you know, that we take responsibility for sins we did not commit. I think sometimes that feels like a forced confession for something that you say, I, I didn't do that. But biblically, there are lots of psalms of lament. There is the book of Lamentations. When horrible things are in our rearview mirror, a unifying experience is to rightly lament painful, sinful, horrible realities. And so I would say that but again, and I bring that up, because, but I want to say that the slavery in the Roman world, I'm not saying it was good, but it was quite different from what is normally comes to mind when we hear that word here in the United States for understandable reasons and what we ought to lament. Of course, the African slave trade was a dark blot, is a dark blot on our conscience as a nation and on that of European Western civilization as a whole. This history is very real, painful, and deeply sad, and honestly, not that long ago. That said, don't read that background into Galatians. Slaves in the Roman world had significant legal rights and protections and were often able to buy their freedom. And most were treated well, and even at times, it was not uncommon for a slave to ascend to a significant position of influence and status. Now, it's not a Roman example, it's an Egyptian example, but it's the same picture. Think of Joseph in Egypt, in Potiphar's house. Of course, he was sold as a slave by his brothers. Don't anybody get, a good, get that idea? A horrible, sinful situation, right? But God had a plan in it, too. And then he was became a slave in Potiphar's household, but what then happened is that he rose and was in authority, a position of incredible influence before he was falsely accused. And to that end, a son and the heir of his father's fortune wasn't treated differently than a slave until he officially came of age. And to state the matter uh, very clearly, it should be very obvious that this was not the case with the African slave trade that is in our nation's rearview mirror. An illustration might help. You say, well, I'm trying to picture what's going on. Uh, several years ago, I was talk uh, a group of us pastors were talking uh, really about this passage, as a matter of fact. And one of the pastors uh, sitting around the table shared a story. Uh, when he was growing up, his best, friend, uh, his, his best friend's dad owned an auto mechanic shop. And he and his best friend uh, in high school worked at the shop. And they were treated the same. Had the same expectations, the same uh, uh, you know, rebukes when they messed up, the same pay, the same treatment, all of that. But there was one notable difference that he knew that I don't think his friend noticed, but he described it. He said, though we were treated the same, had the same job description, the same pay, everything was the same, I knew that one day my friend was going to own the business. 
when his dad decided to hand off uh, you know, the, uh, the business uh, that, to his son that he was going to be the owner and I was not. Uh, that's not a perfect picture of what's in view here, but it helps get the sense. And of course, that handoff of the business would happen at a time set by the, fa- uh, by the father who was also the owner. Both sons were treated, or both were treated well, but one would one day own the business. Now, with that in mind, let's look again at verse three, and it says this: "In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world." Now, you might want to underline or circle "enslaved" or "slavery" in your Bible if you like to underline or circle. It's key, and the message here is clear: apart from Christ, there is only spiritual slavery. <clears throat> now, Bible scholars have lots of discussions about exactly what is referred to by the elementary principles of the world. And I'd simply state that in the context of Galatians, it's difficult to imagine it referring to anything other than to the law. <clears throat> to referring to attempting to relate to God on the basis of our performance of the law, which is legalism. In a, and in a word, it's slavery. Seeking to relate to God through our performance, futilely and desperately trying to do enough, can be only described as slavery. Think about it with me for a little bit. When we look at God's law, and when we think about it and examine it closely, and we try to keep it, we realize very quickly that we are unable to keep God's law, that we are unable to live up to his standards. So the law does a very good job of one thing, condemning us. You say, what do I mean? That's, that's a, an incredible downer. Well, it is, but just stick with me here for a minute. God's law, his standards, show us our need. They make us tremendously uncomfortable because we see God's standard and we go, I'm not there. I may want to be there, but not perfectly, not really, in twisted and strange motivations. I may try, but I fall way short. And I see my sin. So the law does a great job of showing us our sin and our need to be saved. It does a great job of showing us our problem, but in and of itself, it is powerless to fix it. The law condemns us. And James 2.10 uh, helps this picture get a little bit worse. Brace yourself. It says, forever keeps the whole law but fails at just one point has become guilty of all of it. Let that one settle in and uh, it's not comforting. Is it? I mean, that's, a, that's, that's this reality. Trying hard to do certain things and avoid doing others in the hopes of God accepting us is futile and it's slavery. Telling ourselves, I do these things and I don't do these other things. I, I try to check all the boxes. And, and you, the constant question is always, have I done enough? And of course the answer is no. I go to church, I give to the poor, I, I help people in need. I do my best, I hope it's enough. Newsflash, it is not. And it's all slavery. Trying to be saved on the basis of our performance of the law is impossible. It's a never-ending treadmill of fear, guilt, and insecurity. That question, have I done enough? Well, the answer is no. And Acts 15, verses uh, 10 and 11 is helpful here, and it says this, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that, have ne- uh, that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? That's talking about the Old Testament law. And it, the Jewish belie- background believers are saying about the Gentile background believers, we haven't been able to bear it. We haven't kept it. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Friends, we either futilely try to keep the law in hopes of being accepted, or we trust Christ who kept the law perfectly for us. 
Let me say that again. We either futilely try to keep the law in the hopes, in the futile hopes of being accepted, or we trust Christ who kept the law perfectly for us. Now, some of you are probably wondering, when I say all that, you're probably saying, but what about the spiritual disciplines? I mean, after all, what about Bible intake, prayer, fellowship, serving, witness, giving? After all, it wasn't all that long ago that I preached a sermon series walking through these vital practices in the Christian life. And these spiritual disciplines, the spiritual disciplines as a whole, are vital. They are good and they are part of living as followers of Christ. But friends, no amount of doing these things will ever earn acceptance before God. We must understand that we're stepping into slavery when we take our eyes off of Christ and start focusing on the things we do and don't do. Good Christian activity can turn sour very quickly and become slavery motivated by guilt, fear, and insecurity instead of joy and freedom. When we begin to stop pleading Christ alone and start pleading Christ and a little bit of these other things that I contribute. No! Jesus Christ in Him alone. Grace. But we can see how we can slide into slavery through the side door, right? Into this never-ending treadmill of fear, guilt, and insecurity instead of joy and freedom. A relationship with Jesus must lead to good works. Hear me. Faith without works is dead. But understand, and this is vitally important, these good works flow out of and are motivated by grace. Not out of fear and dread. Not out of just hoping I've done enough. And we never can, by the way. We obey motivated by love because we are accepted. Not to be accepted, which is slavery. Think about it. It's easier to start falling into slavery here than we'd like to admit because the problem is we could always do more. Let me just be honest. Could you always read your Bible a little bit more? Pray a little bit more? Make better use of the opportunities that God has given you. Be more generous. Serve in more ministries. We could always do more. And I'm not saying that's not a good question to ask when we're responding to the grace of God. But do you see how this could turn into a never-ending treadmill of fear, guilt, and insecurity? We practice the spiritual disciplines because we have been accepted on the basis of of what Jesus Christ has done. Full stop. Not in the hopes of earning acceptance. That's spiritual slavery, and it's futile. And this ought to be tremendously liberating to pause and to think about that. To pause and think about the wonder of grace. I can't save myself. No hope at saving myself. But God has done for me, for us, what we are powerless to do for ourselves. He sent His one and only Son. We celebrate His coming at Christmas. We look to the cross where He died as our substitute. We look to the resurrection. Let's keep moving and turn to verses 4 through 7. Through Christ's coming, through Christmas, that's another way to say that, freedom instead of slavery is available. Now we're to the good side of the news here. All who trust in Christ as Savior have been adopted into the family of God. Look again at verses 4 and 5, and I suggest writing Christmas in the margin of your Bible next to these verses if you'd like to do that. Verses 4 and 5, these words change everything. And remember, the backdrop is the slavery that we just talked about. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Being in slavery is a miserable place to be, and God sending His Son is the solution to our default condition of slavery to sin and death. 
This is a window looking on Christmas. And yes, I realize it's not Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. But this is Christmas. In fact, this is one of the most compact yet comprehensive statements of the message of Christmas in the entire Bible. Think about it. According to God's sovereignty, according to His perfect plan, His perfect timing and plan, He sent His one and only Son. He was born and laid in a Bethlehem manger, all according to God's perfect plan. He came not a moment early and not a moment late. Let's zoom in on that phrase, but when the fullness of time had come for just a few minutes, there's an amazing story here. An amazing story of God's plan throughout the ages. An amazing story of fulfilled prophecy. Think back all the way to the beginning of the Bible, of course, to creation, but then to Genesis chapter 3. in Adam and Eve's rebellion against God by eating the forbidden fruit. And immediately after creation, of course, came the fall, and God promised to send a Savior right there in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall into sin. The Lord says to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. Heal. Now that picture develops throughout Scripture, but we see this cosmic struggle between the seed of the woman or the offspring of the woman and the serpent. And that points all the way to Jesus who triumphed over the serpent. Then the first taste of the promise, a Savior would come to crush the head of the serpent. And then throughout the Old Testament, the Father's perfect plan to send His Son is put into motion. The Lord promised Abraham that through his offspring, all the peoples of the world would be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. God says to Abraham, I will make, you, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make, you great, make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Where does that point? That points to Jesus, to the Gospel. All the, in, in whom are all the peoples of the earth blessed? Well, of course, in the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And then God, the Lord promised Moses in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. And there's the promise to David that a king from his line would be on the throne forever. First Samuel, or, uh, 2 Samuel 7.16 And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Did you catch that key word, forever? And when the wise men showed up in, uh, in Jerusalem, then they ultimately went to Bethlehem, of course, but when they went to Jerusalem, what did they say? Where is he who has been, what? Born King of the Jews. Jesus is the one who has been born King. In the very first words of the New Testament, Matthew 1.1, a genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see God's promise? Fulfilling God's promises to Abraham, fulfilling God's promises to David, a king who will be on the throne forever. Isaiah prophesied the circumstances uh, of his coming. This is Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call His name Emmanuel. And the prophet Micah predicted the place of His birth in Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little among the clans of Judah, from you shall come for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old from ancient days. His coming was long expected. He came according to God's perfect time and plan. Throughout the Old Testament, God was preparing the way to bring His Son into the world. And additionally, I should mention that according to God's sovereignty and His perfect plan, the pieces of the puzzle were in place to allow the Gospel to spread like wildfire throughout the Roman world. Uh, there was Roman political stability. Now, I'm not saying Rome was godly. It was far from it. If you study the history, Rome was very ungodly. But there was a widespread peace and stability. 
There was a road system that was impressive. And Greek was the common trade language. The the world had a common trade language. It had an infrastructure for travel. And it had political stability. It was a world ready for the gospel to spread throughout the Mediterranean world like wildfire. The time was right and the world was ready. Listen again to verse 4 in Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. And with these words in mind, I want to turn quickly to Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, to the traditional Christmas story, and listen to this picture that's spoken, that, uh, that's focused on Joseph. Matthew 1, beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When His mother Mary had been, uh, been, had been betrothed to Joseph, Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, betrothal was more than contemporary engagement and less than marriage, and unfaithfulness was regarded as adultery. So the circumstances were complex as Jesus was born to a virgin, young Jewish woman named Mary. You say, why were they complex? Because this is a one-time thing. Joseph, what's happening here? My betrothed is, is pregnant. Can you hear echoes of Isaiah 7.14? The virgin shall be with child. And Jesus was born under the Jewish law. Can you hear echoes of Galatians 4.4? The virgin conception and birth was a powerful miracle to state the very least. Jesus had no natural human father. God is His Father. He was born of a woman in the words of Galatians 4.4. He is the offspring or seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3.15, the one who would crush the head of the serpent. And did you catch the reason for Christ's coming? God's promised Savior, Matthew 1.21. She will bear a son, and you shall name Him Jesus. Why? For He will save His people from their sins. Now there's a little bit in Greek here that we can miss in English, because it's not really possible to translate directly. The name Jesus means Yahweh, or the Lord, saves. So, His name was a declaration of His mission. You will name Him the Lord saves because He will save His people from their sins. Now, I understand we don't really translate it that way, but you get the sense. His name declared His mission. And back in verses 4 and 5 of Galatians, we see the same thing. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. Instead of using the word save, here's the word is redeem, that we might receive adoption as sons. He was born of Mary, a virgin Jewish young woman, born under the Jewish law. He came to redeem those under the law that we might be adopted into the family of God. The Father has sent His Son into the world to redeem us from spiritual slavery to sin and death. This is glorious news. Think with me. Do you like the tradition of giving and receiving gifts at Christmas? Kids, will you agree? Do you like that? I don't think any kid could honestly say, no, I I don't like that. Um, Maybe uh, you remember getting up early Christmas morning excited to see all the presents wrapped up under the tree. Well, we ought to pause and remember that behind this great tradition stands the greatest gift the world has ever known and will ever know. 
God sending his son into the world to redeem those, to redeem us, that we might be adopted and become members of the family of God. Pause and ponder that. Jesus, the baby in the manger, was born to set us free. Christmas is all about the Savior. And because of Christmas, there is entrance into God's family. The last two verses of our passage in Galatians, verses 6 and 7. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Now we could translate child, and that might be helpful. Sons gets at the sense, because in the ancient world, the son was the heir. That's different today, but heirs. Children of God, sons of God. Because of Jesus' coming and subsequently the Holy Spirit indwelling, living inside of believers, we can cry out in prayer, Abba, Father. Now I know we don't normally use the word Abba. It's not part of our everyday vocabulary and that really makes a lot of sense because it's Aramaic. But this is significant. It's a personal way of addressing God. And it means that we can address God with the language of a close-knit family. Our jaws should drop in wonder when we begin to think of the enormity of what this is saying. We can cry out, Abba, Father, to the One who spoke the universe into existence. We can take the words, Abba, Father, on our lips which were the words that Jesus took on His lips in Mark chapter 14 in the garden, right before the cross. Abba, Father. The language of a close family. and A term of endearment. Because of Jesus' coming, it is no longer necessary to relate to God through the formal and impersonal categories of the law. Because of Jesus' coming... We can know God and have a personal relationship with Him. We can be part of God's family. Think about at His death. What happened? There was a moment when the curtain in the temple that separated the holiest place away from everyone else, that curtain in the temple was torn in an instant in two from top to bottom. What is the message? We can know God and have a relationship with Him. This is glorious. This is Christmas. The doors are open to enter God's family. We were slaves, but God sent Christ to free us and give us adoption, full adoption into His family. Ponder the magnitude of having a relationship with our Creator. The relationship we were created to have, but lost because of the fall. Saved. Freed from the condemning regime of the law. Remember, the law shows us our need, but doesn't fix it. It shows us we're a sinner and condemns us. Jesus is the solution. Now, as we close, I'd like to encourage all of us to pause and consider and ask ourselves some searching and honest questions. Ask and honestly answer the question, Is my picture of Christmas much too small? Ask yourself, do I need to gaze with wonder out of a fresh window looking at the message of Christmas this year? Because our picture of Christmas can become hijacked or at least clouded by the glitz and busyness of the season. Please hear me, I like Christmas lights. Carols, decorations, candlelight services, and I like the decorations here in this building. But we mustn't let these good things cloud out the central message. Ask yourself, do I need to gaze with wonder? Pause and ponder. Allow my jaw to drop and my knees to bend. Looking out a fresh window, looking at the message of Christmas. Christmas is this, when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Christmas is, she will bear a son and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. And with that, ask one more question. Where does my story intersect with the Christmas story? 
Christ came to save us from our sins. And his birth in Bethlehem was a culminating moment in God's rescue plan. And the word rescue reminds us of the peril that universally defines the human experience ever since Adam and Eve. We were created, we have been created to glorify God and enjoy a relationship with Him. But sin broke that relationship. And Christmas is celebrating that all who trust in Jesus as Savior have been adopted, becoming members of God's family. We can know God and have a relationship with Him. Have a personal relationship with Him. Where does my story intersect with the Christmas story? What's my response to the Savior? Am I a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you can't say that your story has personally intersected the Christmas story in this way. You can turn your life over to the Lord Jesus this morning. You can worship King Jesus. Tell Him that you're a sinner and ask Him to save you. Tell Him that you are placing your faith in Him alone to save you. Tell Him that you are surrendering your life to Him. This Christmas, let's reflect with wonder and joy. Let's never lose the wonder of what God has done in sending His Son, what Christ has done for us. God the Father sent His one and only Son, the agent of creation, the second person of the Trinity, God Himself. He came and was born as a baby, fully God and fully man, to make it possible for us to be freed from the chains of slavery to sin and death. 1 John 4.14 says it like this, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. I encourage you to ponder this message from a different perspective. The only fitting response is worship. Perhaps this Christmas, you'd like to investigate this further. If you'd like to uh, grab, there's a free book in the back. We're asking one per family, per family, please. It says, The Case for Christmas. And it's written by the man who also wrote The Case for Christ. He was a, an agnostic or maybe even atheist journalist for the Chicago Tribune who was challenged to investigate Jesus. It's quite a story. And he became a believer. And he talks about how he investigated Christmas in the book, The Case for Christmas, and how he became a Christian. How he came to come to grips with these realities, the reality of the Savior's coming. They're available in the back. But for all of us, I challenge us, respond in worship, in awe and wonder, as we gaze on this message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about you sending your son. The only fitting response is worship. Lord, I pray that we would worship you this Christmas, and I pray also that you would give us opportunities to tell the world around us the reason Christmas is such a big deal, to tell the world around us the reason for the hope that we have, the message of the gospel. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.